What's up YouTube, Stomp603 here and today we're going to do a review on the Sig Sauer 516. This is a short stroke piston operated AR chambered in 556. This is the Gen 2 and during the video I'll go over the differences between Gen 1 and Gen 2 and with that let's get started. Okay, let's get all the boring stuff out of the way real quick. This is the stuff off of Sig Sauer's website. Um, this is the Sig 516 Patrol FDE, flat dark earth, that refers to the color. Uh, and it says under the description, the Sig 516 Patrol FDE in flat dark earth with a matching FDE finish on both upper and lower receivers and aluminum handguards. As with all SIG 516 patrol rifles, the Flat Dark Earth uses SIG Sauer's innovative short stroke gas push rod operating system, which reduces chamber debris and allows the rifle to run cleaner and cooler. And we'll go over that more in depth later on. Uh, this system, along with the SIG Sauer proprietary full supported extractor, enables SIG 516 to be one of the only rifles to pass NATO's over the bench test. A 16 inch nitride treated barrel is chambered in 556 NATO and is surrounded by a free floating aluminum uh, foregrip. The top rail is optic ready and includes six hour flip up iron sights. Um, and under specifications real quick, semi-automatic, which means you got to pull the trigger for every single bullet to be fired. You can't just hold it and have it go auto. Um, like I said earlier, short stroke gas push rod system. 5.56 NATO, which obviously will shoot 223 as well. And we'll go over that. Uh, 36.7 inches with the collapsible stock extended, 33 inches with it collapsed. Trigger type is mil spec. This has got a Geisley trigger in it. We'll go over that later. Um, trigger weight, this stock trigger is 7.6 pounds. Like I said, mil spec. Barrel length is 16 inches. Uh, the rifling is 1 and 7 with six grooves. Weight without mag is 7.4 pounds. Um, they come with 30 round magazines. I got a 10 in it currently. Um, accessory reel, yes. Upper lower fore end flat dark earth finish and then FDE SIG stock for fore end and grip. Um, MSRP on this, it's pretty steep. It's 1942. Um, I got it at the six hour pro shop for 16 something. Uh, California compliant, hell no. Uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut compliant, hell no. Um, located in New Hampshire, so our motto is live free or die, so pretty much anything goes here. So um, with that, uh, let's start getting a little bit more detailed. Okay, just to show you um, what I've put on this so you don't expect this if you were to purchase this for 1942 or however much they're going to charge you. Um, obviously I put a bipod on it and the angled foregrip that does not come on it. This is also Magpul. These black clips are Luru tactical clips. Um, they don't come on there as well so your whole fore, fore end here will be all flat dark earth. Uh, I put the Nikon P223 scope on there. Uh, it comes with flip up sights and these are very nice sights. Um, no need to upgrade there. Very happy with those. They're very well made and just the way they you can feel when they move up and down is very tight. Um, no wiggling or anything. So um, I use 10 round magazines. I usually do 10 shot strings. So it comes with 30, a 30 round magazine. Uh, I put the Geisley SSAE trigger in here. Um, it's a lighter, 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 lighter trigger, trigger pull less than half of mil spec. Um, I put the pistol grip on it. Comes with just your standard AR flat grip with some stippling on it. And then it comes with the Magpul collapsible stock. Okay. So that's what my AR, how I got set up. So um, let's get a bit, little bit more detailed. Okay, so the big difference between a piston AR and a direct impingement AR. Direct impingement's been around forever. It's been in the M16s, the M4s, back in Vietnam, and up until now. Great operating system. This is the newer style, though. That's why this weapon costs a little bit more. Um, two biggest, the biggest difference on a direct impingement, the ones that have been around forever, when you fire a bullet, the gas goes to a block, goes into a tube, 
and then the gas will go be forced back into the chamber and that gas will push on the bolt carrier, push it back to cycle the weapon and load another round. So those hot gases, like I said, come down a tube and they end up in your chamber. Hot gases in your chamber, carbon buildup, dry, because if you have it lubed up and everything like you should, it's eventually going to bake all that off of there. Um, and that leads to, you know, weapon malfunction where it won't cycle. Piston system, um, instead of the gas going back into the chamber, the gas still goes through a block and it comes out about right here under the fore, fore end here. Um, and what it, the gas does is it pushes on a piston which pushes the bolt carrier back rather than gas. So no hot gases in your chamber, um, in your upper receiver here. So when you lightly lube it up, it'll stay lubed up, it stays nice and clean, you can shoot thousands of rounds, and you ain't got to worry about weapon malfunction. So that's the biggest difference between direct impingement and piston operated. This is the Gen 2, and the Gen 1 has been around for a while, not too long, but um, obviously they made a couple changes to it. Let me take this out for you real quick. This is the piston, and this is the part that is going to cycle the chamber. So on Gen 1s, this used to be threaded. You'd have to thread that piston all the way out to get it to come out. Threads were about yay long. Like I said, all that carbon and stuff that's in this area get all, got all over those threads and made it difficult to remove that piston. I don't know if you saw me do that or not, but all I did was like a half turn and it slides right out. Okay, I'll just show you this real quick. You'll see it later on. This is the piston that actually pushes back on your bolt carrier like this and it cycles the next round. So, big, huge difference if you're trying to figure out if a weapon's Gen 1 or Gen 2, just take out this piston or this piston here and see if there's it's threaded or not. If it's not threaded, you got yourself a Gen 2, and if it is threaded, you got a Gen 1. While I'm on this area here, the 516, that piston's got little holes in it, and that, that allows so much gas to go through it. This has got four positions on it. Um, one is for no gas to go and cycle that piston, which will essentially make this a, like a bolt gun, one single shot, and then you got to manually charge it. Um, another setting is for suppressors. The third setting is for normal operating. And then the fourth setting is for adverse conditions. If you're getting into muddy water and dirt and all that stuff, um, it allows more gas to cycle that bolt. Um, so I just wanted to mention that before I forgot. So that is the how the piston works there. So um, another change that they did on the Gen 2 with the Gen 1, the bolt closely resembled uh, LWCR's bolt. Um, there was a big lawsuit and everything, SIG 1, um, but they redesi redesigned the bolt so it didn't resemble or supposedly resemble uh, LWCR's bolt. So that's the differences between Gen 1 and Gen 2. And even with the bolt thing, there's, you know, discussion about it was actually redesigned um, at the end of Gen 1, not necessarily Gen 2. Doesn't really matter. Just wanted to mention that. Okay, when you're buying an AR, um, there's two different options for this caliber. There's 5.56 and 2.23. The big debate is, or if not really a debate, but if you don't know much about it, um, which rifle should you buy? always you want to buy a 556 and on your barrel it will clearly say 556 or 223 what is the difference 556 is what the military uses that's their 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 round um, with the powder you know it's a hotter load if you want to call it that versus, you know versus 223 Without getting too involved in, you know, why 223 won't fire in 5.56, all I want to say is, if you have a 5.56, it will obviously shoot 5.56, and it'll also shoot 223. 
if you have a 223 stamped on your barrel, it is not recommended that you shoot 556. Five, um, if you're into reloading and all that stuff, you know why. Um, it has to do with the amount of space um, where the bullet is sitting. I don't like I said I don't want to get too involved in that, but it could possibly blow up in your face because that weapon is not designed for that hotter round. Okay, so that's five five six is what you want. You're after. All right, so I'm going to take the piston out again real quick, just because when I got this taken apart, I want to show you how it goes against the bolt carrier. So we'll stick that right there. Sorry about the uh, crowdedness here. So there's two pins, that's it, um, that releases the upper receiver from the lower. So you're going to push this back one out, pull it out through the other side, and it won't fall out, it's made to stay in there. And then you can see it separates. So then we're going to push this front one out. And SIGs are, the tolerances are very tight. So some rifles... These pins will come out very easy, and other ones, they'll come out stiff. Stiff is better, obviously. One other thing while I got this apart before I forget, I want to show you. Um, in the bottom down here, it's hard to see. There's a, a spring-loaded detent, or pin, or whatever you want to call it. It's the same type that holds your buffer spring in, or your buffer. Um, what that does is it puts you know, upward force on your upper, and that keeps them from sloppily you know moving side to side and stuff like a lot of the other ARs so that was one nice little feature that SIG incorporated so I'm going to sit this to the side and we'll turn this around for you so then all you're going to do is you pull it on your charging handle and your bolt carrier group will come out I'll go over that in a second and then you can just pull your charging handle out. No tools required to disassemble something that way. If it breaks, you know, when you're in combat or out at the range or whatever, you can totally take it apart, fix whatever, put it back together. No tools. All right. So this piston, when it comes in through the front, it sticks in, you know, about that far into the chamber area, your upper receiver. Okay. And what that does is, it's in your weapon like this, okay? This is the bolt carrier. There's your firing pin. This is what's, let me get around here so I can show you real quick. I'll just get a piece of empty brass. Your brass is going to be in there like this, okay? It's trying to eject it right now. So it sits in there, your primer obviously in the bottom, your firing pin comes through the middle. So when this cycles, it picks up another round, puts it in the chamber. Okay. And then when you fire, like I said, the gas comes down at this end down here, and it, this piston forces that bolt carrier back, ejects the round, picks up another round from the mag, and then comes forward. And then when you fire again, it does the same thing. So on a direct impingement, instead of it being a piston like this, it's just a hollow aluminum tube. Uh, tube. And gas comes down that tube and poof, pushes out on the bolt carrier, and that's what cycles it. So this thing, this bolt carrier is going, as fast as you can pull the trigger, it's going back and forth. So, you know, you lube it up so it doesn't gouge the inside of your upper in here, because this is constantly going back and forth. And then all that hot gas and everything gets inside here, takes the oil off of all the parts, gets real dry, and then you've all dealt with carbon before, just it's a mess to clean. I cleaned M16 a million times in the military. I hate cleaning inside here. That's the biggest reason why I went with a piston, so I don't even have to really do much with this at all. I can go out and shoot five, six hundred rounds, not even clean it, just run a bore snake down the, the barrel and then go out and shoot it again, five or six hundred rounds or whatever. When I do eventually take it apart to clean this out, I'm wiping it off with a rag and there's virtually nothing on this bolt carrier. Okay, Very clean, 
Um, the piston gets nasty, obviously. Um, that's a little bit of a chore to clean out. This is the, the part that's inside the block. This gets all nasty. These are your little holes. I'll, I'll take pictures of this stuff and put it embedded in the video so you can see the stuff clearer. But you can see there's three different size holes there. That's part of the four different positions that can, this can go in that we talked about earlier. Suppressor, you know, adverse you know, conditions. Um, yeah, so the piston block here, very nasty in there. Every now and then I'll take my hand guards off and clean it out really good in there. So, again, ten times easier than direct impingement. Uh, your bolt carrier, um, this comes apart really easy. Again, no tools. You just take this little cotter pin out. I just cleaned it up so there's lube on it. There's your firing pin. Take that little piece out. And then the bolt comes out. Put it back together. Very simple. Put the firing pin back in. Put this little cotter pin back in. And there you go. Two seconds to take it apart. Easiest weapon to take apart. It's got a million different configurations and add-ons. It's kind of limitless. That's what the fun thing about ARs is you can totally make it your own and customize the hell out of it. Um, so there you go. There's breaking it down. Went over the bolt carrier. I mean, you can get aftermarket bolt carriers. Um, just everything can be upgraded to make any. It's like any other thing, any other hobby. You can get totally ridiculous with it. Um, the lower, like I said, 10 round magazine, these are Magpul, um, Mag, or excuse me, PMAG, PMAG 10, these are the newer ones, these are Gen M3, um, I like 10 round because when you're shooting with the bipod, the 30 round sometimes is too tall, um, Geisley Trigger, let me go over that real quick, okay, Geisley makes outstanding triggers they got a million different ones that they make um, ones for mat shooting and all that stuff and um, this one's a super semi automatic enhanced SSAE trigger um, on their site it's going for 240 right now I picked mine up for 229.99 at SIG um, like I said 7.6 is this is the mil spec trigger that came out in this originally um, 7.6 pounds uh, trigger pull so you just keep pulling keep pulling keep pulling keep pulling until it breaks and then fires the weapon 7.6 pounds to do that on the SSAE trigger it's a two-stage trigger uh, let's see if I can show you this real quick so when you're pulling it it's got two stages that's what I want to go over here your first stage there's nothing there you can feel it like stop okay and then for the first stage the weight is 2.3 pounds so remember I was telling you 7.6 is the military spec one that comes in here so 2.3 pounds till it stops right there and then as soon as I do it a whisk or more it's gonna release the hammer okay that second stage weight is 1.2 pounds so very hair trigger you know my nephew got out of the military and he went to go shoot it. He was on target and everything. Put his finger on there, went off. He did not expect it to go off at all. Um, so it's two stage trigger. Geisley makes a, um, two stage triggers that you can actually adjust the amount of pull weight on them. Um, this is not one of those. But what it boils down to is the less you have to pull on the trigger, the more you're going to stay on target. So if I got to pull a 7.6 um, pound trigger, you're naturally pulling up on the weapon. Um, if I got I'm resting right on, you know, my second stage there, and just a whisker more, you ain't going to pull up on the weapon as much as you would one with a 7.6 pound trigger. So uh, very first mod that I made to it. It's an absolute must unless, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the trigger that comes in it. I used it for years in the military. You can be just as accurate. 
Um, obviously, you shoot a million rounds through that with that trigger, you're going to be dead on. I just like the a lot easier trigger, um, especially if you're shooting real far distances. So that's the Geisley trigger. All right, so just a couple more things on this the rail. They are numbered, so if you do take um, an optic off or whatever you got on, you know, light or laser, you know exactly which groove to put it back on. On this fore end, it is full floating. That's another huge thing um, nowadays with ARs. Basically, you're holding the weapon like that, and if you're putting pressure on the fore end, it translates to putting pressure on the barrel, um, which won't be as accurate. So. You can put all the pressure you want on this this forend here, and it's not going to move the barrel at all. All right, so we'll just reassemble this real quick, just so I can show you how easy it is. Uh, we'll put our charging handle in there first. There's a little groove that it sits down in, and then you can start sliding it in. I'm going to put our bolt carrier back in there. Just slide that forward. Turn it around. We'll put our gas rod back in. Now there's a flat side on this piece here, and the other side's rounded. You want the flat side down. And then we're going to put it on the normal setting. Uh, Without getting too technical, with direct impingement, you have a gas tube, like I said, that runs down the top of the barrel and goes into your upper receiver. On your barrel, there's a nut at the end here, a lock nut, um, that you use to tighten it up. With direct impingement, that lock nut has um, cutouts in it all the way around it. So that way you tighten up your barrel nut and you line up one of those cutouts with where the tube needs to go through it. That's kind of, um, for competition shooters and stuff, that's a disadvantage because this barrel nut needs to be torqued to a certain foot-pounds. So it, with that direct impingement, say you torque it to where it needs to be, and but your tube won't go through, you only have two options, either tighten it more or back it off a little bit. So, you know, anything with, you know, shooting, everything is a science, it's exact. So with the piston system, um, you don't have that problem, so just thought that'd be worth mentioning. So then we'll put on the lower. We're just going to line up our first holes. And, then, and this is the spring loaded I was telling you about. See how it's pushing it away? Force it together. Slide your pen in and that pushes tension on the upper and that keeps it from flopping all around. Uh, nothing in the magazine. And then we'll just do a... And then your trigger. Very light pull. So there you have it, the SIG 516. Um, I got a couple friends that are interested in buying ARs and they've been asking me a lot of questions on you know piston versus direct impingement 556 versus 223 so that's the reason why I kind of wanted to do this video to hopefully clear up some of that stuff so uh, with that I'll take some pictures of some close-ups on some of the stuff we talked about I'll get this video put together and we'll get it on the uh, YouTube so uh, if you like these kind of videos I'm gonna keep doing them on weapons and reloading so please subscribe i'm trying to get to 500 subscribers so i can change the url um, for youtube so with that happy reloading and safe shooting